Hi, my name is Patrick Curran, and along with Dan Bauer, we make up Curran Bauer Analytics. In this episode of Office Hours, I'm going to continue our discussion of the structural equation model with a focus on model evaluation. So in prior episodes, we've talked about a variety of forms that the SEM can take. Uh, path analysis, factor analysis, the full structural equation model. And in each of those episodes, I've said, all right, at this point, we would determine whether the model fit or not. And then I said, I'm going to defer that to a later episode when we can focus on the topic in more detail. And this is the later episode. So to begin, Evaluating model fit and determining whether a particular structural equation model appropriately fits the characteristics of the sample that we observed is an incredibly contentious topic. There's a vast literature on this in uh, different people recommending different strategies, different cutoffs, different criteria. And so just to begin this episode, I want to emphasize that there is no universally accepted strategy for doing this. Um, some people very strongly argue for one thing over another, and then another group will strongly argue for that other thing over the first thing, and there's, there's not extensive agreement on how we evaluate models. And the other thing to keep in mind is that there is no single number that is going to determine whether our model fits whether our theory is correct. It just some, simply doesn't exist. It is There's not going to be a fit index. There's not going to be a chi-square value. There's not going to be some numerical measure that if our estimate of that falls below some cutoff, our theory is correct. And if it falls above the cutoff, our theory is incorrect. What it is instead is we're going to need to build a case for supporting that our model fits our data. That is, we're going to draw on multiple sources of information. No one thing is going to adjudicate up or down whether our hypothesis is correct or not. But instead, we're going to draw on a variety of pieces of information from the model and then try to make a principled, reasoned argument for why we believe that the parameterization of our data adequately reproduces the characteristics of the data. So thinking about those issues as a starting point, let's return very briefly to the one predictor multiple regression model. All right, so this is going to teleport back to a uh, prior class that you may have had. Um, I uh, have mentioned before, but Dan has a whole playlist of office hour videos on the multiple regression model. And so if you're interested, you could look there. But just as a one predictor model, Say we have some outcome y sub i is a function of an intercept, we'll call it beta naught, plus some weighted contribution of a predictor, so it would be beta 1 times x1 sub i, plus some residual, all right, epsilon sub i. And so that's going to be um, what is left over of the observed value of y after taking into account information about the predictor. And as you may have seen before, is we have a regression model where we have these individual dots are the observed y, all right, that's what this is, and the distance between the observed y and the line, that point is going to be y hat, all right, that's the predicted value of the outcome, and that distance between y and y hat is epsilon. All right, that's the error. And so literally we can say, well, that the residual for person I is their observed score, y sub i, minus their predicted score, y hat sub i. So it's observed minus expected. And what we do is, if this is the intercept of the regression line, we'll denote that beta naught, and we have some slope of the regression line denoted beta 1, right, because this is our predictor x and our outcome y, is um, if to calculate our sample estimates of beta naught and beta 1, so that we get beta hat naught and beta hat 1, those are our sample estimates, what we do is select values of the intercept and slope to minimize the sum of the squared residuals. All right, so we can say i equals 1 to n is, is we take the residual, we square it, we add them up, and we pick values of the intercept and the slope to be as small as possible. 
And that's where the term ordinary least squares comes from. The least squares part is we minimize the sum of the squared residuals. What I want to focus on here is this issue, is we have what we observed on y and we have what the model predicts y hat. And the, the, our, the better fit of our model, the better confidence we have in our prediction model is the closer y and y hat are to one another. So the better job we're doing at reproducing um, our outcome variable y based on information that we have on x. All right, so we have observed value y, model implied value y hat, and our fit is going to be measured in the difference between those two, between y and y hat. If you grasp that, if you, if you can get your head around what we observed and what we predicted, and how can we make those as close as possible, that's the entire SEM and how we're going to try to evaluate fit. It's just a little bit more complicated, because instead of having one outcome variable y, we're going to have a whole set. Usually, we have a whole set of dependent variables on y. And so we need to generalize this process to a multivariate kind of framework. And so that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to define a couple of things. All right, first is I'm going to define a vector called theta. All right, and theta, it's a vector, so we put a little tilde under it. And I'm going to transpose it just so I can draw it um, horizontally. Um, the details of this aren't important. If you haven't had matrix algebra before, it's, it's really not that important. But what theta contains are all the parameters that we're going to estimate in our model, that, that are used to define our model. So if you've seen prior episodes in this SEM series, we've talked about the path analysis. And those are, are dominated by regression coefficients, residual variances. Then we moved to the factor analysis, and that introduced item residuals and factor loadings. We called those lambdas. And then we moved to the SEM, where we had the lambdas, the factor loadings, and the regression coefficients and covariances. All of those are the models that, excuse me, the parameters that define our model. Theta is going to contain all of those parameters for whatever model it is. Uh, that we're estimating. So it may have lambdas for factor loadings, lambda 1, 2, 3. It may have theta epsilons that are residual variances. It may have gammas. It may have size. It doesn't matter. There, this is done in a principled way. Um, in Ken Boland's book on structural equation modeling, and uh, published in 1989, he gives very clear, wonderful details of this. And I'd recommend you look at that if, if you want to learn more. But the point that I want to get across is we've got this vector theta, and we literally can think about this as our model. If it's a factor model, a path analysis, an SEM, even if it's a latent growth curve model in the SEM, is all of our parameters are contained in theta. Okay, well, so what, right? Why is that important? Well, always keep in mind the y and the y hat from regression, right? So the y is what we observed, the y hat is what we predicted. Well, what we can do is we can say the covariance matrix denoted sigma, all right, this is a capital Greek sigma, so this is a full matrix. We can express a model implied covariance matrix as a function of this vector theta. That is, there's a population covariance matrix denoted sigma that just exists by itself, all right? So we have sigma is the population covariance matrix of all of our variables. So if we have five observed variables, it's a five by five covariance matrix. If we have 20 observed variables, it's a 20 by 20 covariance matrix. It's just our usual standard covariance matrix. All right, now covariances, they're in the raw metric of the measures. We can standardize that and it'll be a correlation matrix. So that's what we're talking about, just establishing the raw metric. All right, so it's a covariance matrix in the population. This is what exists out there beyond the horizon, this covariance matrix. This is what's implied by the model, all right? Model implied covariance matrix, all right? So what is that? 
This is sometimes called, you'll, you'll encounter in linear matrix algebra, it's called a matrix valued function is we take these parameters, whatever it is that, that we have in our model, that define our model, and we can arrange them in a particular way to give us the model implied covariance matrix. Again, see Boland's book for this. He gives just unambiguously clear detail in working through all of this. Just to give one example, for the covariance, the model implied covariance matrix for a confirmatory factor model, CFA, we can give as lambda psi lambda prime plus theta epsilon. All right, that's for the CFA. The details of this are unimportant. If you don't know what this expression is, it's not important. What I want you to see is the pattern of this. Is notice this lambda psi and theta are all the elements in the, the parameter vector. So that is our model. And what this says is if we arrange these in this particular way, we are going to get a covariance matrix that the model believes to exist. So the game we're playing is, is if this model holds, right, and when I say this model, it's this theta, if this model holds, we would observe this covariance matrix, right? Notice the similarity to y hat. Right? It's the model implied value of the outcome and regression. This is the model implied covariance matrix for the SEM. Now remember in the regression model we have our observed variable y. This is, we haven't observed things yet. This is still population level. This is our population covariance. So you can see where the natural draw is. Is we have the population covariance matrix and we have the model implied covariance matrix and the adequacy of our model, that is the goodness of fit of our model, is going to be reflected in the distance between those two. If sigma theta exactly equals sigma, it says the implication is, is our model is correct. That because the model that we defined in theta gives us exactly the same covariance matrix that exists in the population then as these begin to, to separate from one another, then that introduces misfit into our model, all right? So how do we make that? Well, let's think about, keep these in mind, the sigma and the sigma theta. And now let's go to what Boland calls in his book, the fundamental hypothesis in SEM, all right? What is that? It's the null hypothesis, all right? So we're all very familiar with this, right? is let's say that we're doing a two sample t-test, all right, and we have group one and we have group two. The null hypothesis is the population mean of group one is equal to the population mean of group two, all right? There is no difference between the two groups in the population. That's the null hypothesis. And our alternative is that they are not equal to one another. Right? So then we get into the whole philosophy of science of, of do we accept the null, reject the null, suspend judgment. There are a lot of really interesting uh, uh, issues that are involved in that. But notice this is just the difference between two means. We also know from just the t-test that it's equivalent where we can say mu1 minus mu2 equals zero or mu1 minus mu2 does not equal zero. Right? All we did was subtract one off of the other. But this, this is where the, the, the term null hypothesis comes from, or sometimes called nil hypothesis. Jack Cohen talked about that. Is it saying in the population there is no difference between the two means? And then how do we adjudicate that? How do we test that? Is we gather data, we compute the, the means and the two groups, we deviate them, we subtract them, and we get some difference, and then we say, so listen, this, this is an important statement. We have some difference between the means, and we say, would we have expected a difference this large or larger if the null hypothesis held in the population? And that's the whole inferential testing from a, a, a you know, Fisher-Pearson, Neiman-Pearson approach. All right, so we're not gonna get into that, what we are going to get into is to say, all right, if that works for a t-test, how can we apply it here? Well, the null hypothesis in SEM is that the covariance matrix that exists in the population is equal to that 
that, it, that is implied by our model. Notice it's still population parameters, and it's saying that we have some p by p covariance matrix where p is our number of observed variables. So if we have 10 predictors or 10 observed variables, it's a 10 by 10 covariance matrix. And the null hypothesis is saying that the population covariance matrix is exactly equal to that implied by the model. And just as we did before, we can say the equivalent is the difference between the covariance matrix that, that exists and that that is implied by the model is zero. There is no difference. All right. So now we're off to the races because we've got the fundamental null hypothesis and now we want to bring our empirical data to bear on this. So what do we do? Well, this is the null, and then our alternative, of course, is just sigma minus sigma theta is not equal to zero. There is some difference between the two. So what do we have? This is the condition that we establish in the population. We don't know what that is, right? We're making an assumption about the population condition. What we do have are two additional pieces of information. We have S which is our sample covariance matrix, okay? This is what we have all done before in classes or in research, is we have our sample of individuals and we get a covariance matrix. Again, if we have 10 measures, it's 10 by 10. Then we fit our model, just as we have done in the prior episodes and talking about, and we get sigma theta hat. Notice there's a hat over this. There's not over this because this is a population value. This is a sample value. And this is the sample model implied covariance matrix. All right. So this is the equivalent conceptually of y in the regression model. This is what we observe. And this is conceptually y hat what the model implies, we're just working at a level of a covariance matrix, that's all, is we have what's observed, the covariance matrix, and we have the covariance matrix that's implied. Well, what do we have a hankering to do is to say, well, what is the difference between what we observed and what was implied? What is the difference between the sample covariance matrix and the model implied covariance matrix? And that's going to be the cornerstone to evaluating our models in practice. So what we want to do is to say, we observed some difference, right, in a sample, almost always, almost without exception, we're going to see a difference between the observed covariance matrix and the model implied. What we want to evaluate from a probabilistic standpoint is how likely is it I would have observed these differences of this size or larger if the null hypothesis truly held in the population. Is it just sampling variability? So we're going to get a little bit of, of difference between the two, and that would be expected just from sampling variability, excuse me, sampling variability given our sample size? Or is it large enough where we say, no, this moves beyond sampling variability? I think there are other sources of misfit. And that's the test of our, our null hypothesis. So how do we do that? That's what introduces the chi-square test statistic, all right? All of us, if you've done it in SEM, if you've, you've read them, these in the literature, is um, the very first piece of information we have available to us is the, the chi-square test. And that is a formal inferential test of the magnitude of the differences between those two matrices and the probability that we would have observed that if they were equal in the population. All right, so um, how we do that, again, is we could talk about this for hours, and I'm trying to shorten it somewhat, is we're going to refer to that as T, which is our sample test statistic, and that follows a chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom K minus lowercase t. All right, these are all arbitrary. It's just kind of what's accepted in the literature. K is the total number of pieces of information that we observed. All the variances, all the covariances, all the means. Here I'm focusing just on covariance structure, but we can extend it to mean structure as well. So all of the number of variances and covariances and means, and T is the number of parameters that we're estimating. 
So if we observe 20 pieces of information and we estimated 10 parameters, we have 10 degrees of freedom. And then we do our usual test uh, uh, procedure where we look up the critical value of the chi-square at this given degrees of freedom and we determine is it likely I would have observed my value under the null or not. And then that's where we determine the p-value, and by just tradition, we use 0.05. Um, it's not terribly well defensible, but it's what we do in practice. And if the probability is less than 5, we say, it is unlikely that I would have observed this test statistic if the null were true. If it's above 05, we conclude the opposite. But here's the tricky part, and this is very tricky, is remember in a two-sample t-test, what does a significant test reflect? Well, if we get a significant, there are my air quotes again, if we get a significant result where the p is less than 0.05, the implication is it is unlikely that I would have observed the test statistic in my data if the null were true, so I reject the null hypothesis, meaning that the two groups are different. But look at what's happening in the SEM. It's actually backwards. And it's kind of a weird thing to think about, is a significant chi-square says that the differences between what we observed and what was expected is larger than we would expect by chance alone, so we're going to reject the null. Well, what are we doing when we reject the null? We're saying our model is incorrect. Right here, the null hypothesis is we're saying our model is right. We have the correct model. If we reject that, we're saying we do not have the correct model. It's unlikely we would have observed our data given this parameterization of the model. A non-significant effect leads us to fail to reject the null, or sometimes people will say we suspend judgment. And so a non-significant chi-square value then implies that our model is correct, right? This is completely backwards from what we're used to. So if we allow ourselves to think about what we want out of a test, right? We're all supposed to be objective scientists, but let's for the moment say, you know, I've worked really hard, I've gathered this data, and I want support for my hypotheses. We hope for a non-significant chi-square test because that will support our model. A lot of literature has been written on how this is kind of backwards. It's a philosophical blind spot. This is not how we should go about doing business, but that is the chi-square. So the chi-square is formal, known. It has sampling distribution. It has known probability values. It's a very important piece of information. But there are two big limitations. One is what I just described is the absence of evidence supports our, our hypothesis, which many argue it should be the opposite, is that we start out with the premise that our model is incorrect and then we have to provide data that shows that it is correct. So that's one limitation. The other is, is these tests tend to be highly powered. That is, in, in moderate to large sample sizes, you almost always get a significant chi-square. And if you don't get a significant chi-square, that tends to say you either have low power and a small n, or you have a very simple model. Because of these limitations, for many, many years, uh, this spans now 40 or 50 years, there have been a whole class of alternative measures of fit that people have proposed. A first class are called relative goodness of fit indices, all right? Relative goodness of fit, GOF indices. There are dozens of these, all right? There are the CFI, the TLI, the IFI, the RNI. Um, there are literally dozens of these, these indices. And all of them are trying to achieve the same kind of thing. Is what it is, is starting out with the premise that the chi-square is important but limited, and so it's going to develop a set of indices that are based on the comparison of your model with some baseline model. Now, as you would imagine, there's a lot of arguing in the literature is what is the proper baseline model. The standard one is all variables are allowed to have a variance, but none are allowed to co-vary with one another. 
That's a very strict baseline model. So it's saying all the data you collected and all the variables that you have, they're completely uncorrelated. They all have a variance, but they're, they're uncorrelated. And then these fit indices say how much, how much improvement is there in model fit with your model relative to this independence baseline. Um, some software packages say, okay, we're gonna have no correlations among dependent variables, but anything that are predictors, we're gonna allow those to co-vary. So it's a slightly different model. Either way, we have like a TLI, that's the Tucker-Lewis index, we have a CFI, we have an IFI, all right? These are, these are all different ones that are developed by Tucker and Lewis. CFI, uh, a lot of great initial writing was done by Peter Bentler. IFI was Ken Bolin. And they're all attempting to take different ratios, different differences in chi-square and degree of freedom for your fitted model and the chi-square and degree of freedom for the baseline model, however you define that. They generally range between zero and one. I say generally because with sampling variability, some can go over, some can go below, but several indices are artificially capped, so if it goes over one, it's fixed to one. Again, dozens of papers written about this. Problem with this is we don't know the sampling distribution of these fit indices. So we don't get p-values, we don't get confidence intervals. And what that means is it's up to all of us to decide whether our fit index is high enough to determine a good fitting model. For many years, good fit was determined by a cutoff of 0 0.90. Arbitrary came up in, in you know, a lot of experienced people using these. Um, a lot of simulation work was done and people said, no, you really should consider over 0.95. But whatever cutoff you use, this is, it's still subjective. It's not well motivated from a statistical standpoint. I might decide 0.93 is high enough. You might demand 0.96. Right? It's, it's completely subjective. But we tend to look for indices at least over 0.9 and hopefully above 0.95 on here. All right, so those are relative goodness of fit indices. The next class of indices we can think about are called absolute fit indices, all right? So we can talk about this absolute fit indices. Why is it called absolute? It is an assessment of model fit that is not relative to some arbitrary baseline model. So it's not comparing the, the improvement in fit of your hypothesized model relative to some independence model where all the variables are allowed to have a variance, but no covariances, and you say, oh, there's a 90, 95% improvement in fit in my model relative to this highly restrictive model. An absolute fit index says, okay, we want to evaluate misfit in terms of some kind of absolute sense with respect to the likelihood function, the fit of the model alone. All right, the key one here is the RMSEA the root mean squared error of approximation. This was originally introduced by Jim Steiger. It was expanded by Michael Brown and Bob Kudak and Bud McCallum and other researchers. Very briefly, just to show one equation, because it's interesting to see how this is done, is to compute the point estimate of the RMSEA for a given model, is we simply take the model chi-square of the fitted of your hypothesized model, subtract the degrees of freedom, divide by degrees of freedom, and multiply by n minus one. All right, if we had more time to talk, I'd work through each of these uh, uh, terms. But in a nutshell, what it's doing is the chi-square minus the degrees of freedom is giving us a sample estimate of what's called the non-centrality parameter. And what this is, is a measure of misfit. It's the shift of the chi-square distribution from a central chi-square to a non-central, and that non-centrality parameter is how far that is. And then we have the non-centrality parameter, and it's divided by degrees of freedom and, and one minus sample size. What this is doing is putting that non-centrality parameter back in the original metric of the likelihood function per degree of freedom. So it is a per degree of freedom uh, uh, measure of misfit of the model, but without respect to some arbitrary baseline model. That's why it's called an absolute um, estimate. Why 
this is particularly uh, uh, promising, is given the, the statistical theory that underlies the non-centrality parameter, we can actually calculate and estimate confidence intervals and p-values for the RMSEA. So remember for the relative fit indice measures, we can't estimate that. Is there, there's some conditions where we can, but we can't easily get p-values or confidence intervals for an incremental uh, fit index or a Tucker-Lewis index or CFI, one of those, but we can for this. <coughs> So what that means is we can get a point estimate and we can get a confidence interval, a 90% or a 95% confidence interval, and any SEM program will give you uh, these values. Here's the problem though, is even though we have these statistically elegant asymptotic confidence interval estimates of the point estimate, that they're not often used in practice, is what tends to happen is uh, an RMSEA value that is less than 0.05 is deemed to be good, all right? So uh, if, if you estimate your model and you get an RMSEA of 0.2 or 0.3, is that falls under the good category. Sometimes um, people will say, well, if it's between 0.05 and 0.08, um, it is borderline right? Isn't that a great term for model evaluation? It's borderline as you're kind of not taking a stand one way or the other. And then if it is, you know, greater than 08 and beyond, then it's poor. And so the bit of irony about the RMSEA is although we have this elegant statistical theory to give us p-values and confidence intervals, those are not often used in practice is those are typically, someone will just say, well, the RMSEA is 0.012 indicating good fit. Part of the problem is, first, it's just totally subjective, right? Your value of RMSEA that is good may well be different than my value of the RMSEA that's good, just because it's a subjective decision. But also, there's a lot of computer simulation work that suggests that the cutoff that would indicate an adequately fitting model depends on a lot of model dependent characteristics of sample size, degrees of freedom, uh, the, the adequacy of fit in terms of R square, things like that. It's very complicated. And so for some models, 05 may work. For some models, 0.1 may be adequate. And for some, 0.01. We just don't know. It varies from model to model. So that is a, a, an issue with the RMSEA. But in practice, you'll most often see somebody say, well, it fell below the 05 criterion and thus model fits well. So we've got the chi-square, we've got the relative goodness of fit index, we have the absolute goodness of fit index, and the final one that we'll consider is called the SRMR. And this is a really interesting little guy. What this stands for is the standardized root mean residual, all right? And what this is, is not an inferential statistics, it's an effect size measure. So remember, a few minutes ago, I talked about how we had S, all right? And that was the observed covariance matrix. And we had sigma theta hat, all right? And that was the implied covariance matrix. And remember, the parallels we're drawing in regression to Y and Y hat, right? It's exactly the same thing conceptually. We have the observed covariance matrix, the model implied. We can subtract those, and we get some residual matrix. We'll just call it R. We can call it anything we want, but we'll just call it R. And that is an element by element. That is, we have, a say, a 10 by 10 covariance matrix we observed, a 10 by 10 covariance matrix that's implied by the model. We just subtract the two, and R is what's ever left over. Those are the residuals. Well, teleport back to regression. What is Y minus Y hat? is epsilon, the residual. You can see it's exactly the same thing. It's just we have an entire matrix of residuals, and to put them in an interpretable metric, we standardize it. So it's like a correlation. And we add them all up, and we uh, uh, take the average of those, and we get some value. It's only a single value to characterize an entire matrix, and what we often find is it's recommended that a good fitting model is less than 08. And so on average, if, if your SRMR is less than 08, 
then you are doing a reasonably good job of, of reproducing the covariance matrix that you observed, and if it's greater, then it's less so. Like everything we've talked about so far, totally subjective, totally arbitrary. Um, there's some simulation work that shows that this value in combination with others uh, does a decent job in adjudicating uh, uh, models and model fit, but it's, we remain completely subjective. And you can imagine what if you have uh, a covariance matrix that has lots of little residuals between the, the two matrices versus one that has one giant residual and all the rest are zero. They both could result in the same SRMR, but we don't know kind of those, those reflect different aspects of model fit. But it remains a, a, a useful, interesting uh, uh, value to consider. So what do we have taking together? All right, we have the model chi-square. We have relative fit indices. We have absolute fit indices. And we have SRMR, all right, which is a standardized residual um, measure. Now, hopefully, you can start to see when somebody says, well, does your model, model fit well or not? Is that's actually a really hard thing to determine because we have all of these pieces of information. We don't have really good guidelines on, on the best cutoffs, particularly with respect to more complex or less complex uh, uh, models. Uh, all of those things come into play. But what we are charged with, and this is what you're charged with in your own work, is you need to pool over all of this information and build a reasoned argument for the reader as to why you believe that your fitted model adequately reproduces the characteristics of the sample that you observe. So what is the chi-square? What are several absolute fit indices? What, is the, what are several uh, relative fit indices? What is the SRMR? And then we can do other things if we have more time to talk about. We could talk about um, evaluating modification indices. Are there a lot of large modification indices? Are there a lot of small ones? Um, we could talk about using likelihood ratio tests to do competing models. These are all more you know, complex ways of approaching it. But you have to jointly look across all of these pieces of information and say, therefore, we conclude that our model adequately reproduces the characteristic of the data that we observed in our sample. And that is, is kind of one paragraph that you could write in presenting your results to the reader. To stress, nothing I've said is set in stone. There are, are many, many academicians and researchers who would disagree with things that I've said. Um, there are some who reject relative fit indices and only want to look at chi-square. Others want to do away with all fit indices and only look at residuals. The middle ground is some balance between all of those things. All of these, in my opinion, have information that's providing to you as a, research, as a researcher. So it's telling you things about about the extent to which your model fits overall and the extent to which that you're able to reproduce that covariance matrix and in later models mean uh, structure as well. We haven't talked about that yet, but those come up in things like growth models or multiple group models. But here it's just the covariance matrix. And so I hope that's of some use in just giving you an initial sense of how you go about evaluating model fit. We've put some citations along in the text with the video uh, that are a, a few papers that describe these things in more detail, and hopefully you'll find this of some use in your own work. Thanks for your time.